let me do a little review for us, and then I'm going to have Mark pray, and we'll get to work. So last week, if you were with us last week, we're in Romans. Uh, we're in a study of the book of Romans. Chapter 1 last week is where we were, and it is some of the most depressing news on planet Earth. Um, the last half of Romans chapter 1 is, is gut-wrenching. talks about what happens when, when people exchange the worship of God for the worship of themselves and other things, and God turns them over uh, to their own selfish desires, and His wrath rests on them. And what ends up ultimately happening is they create a culture in which everything is permissible. And Paul unloads on that group of people, the irreligious people, if you will. And Paul says, God's judgment is coming because your conscience declares to you that there is a God. And all men are without excuse, Paul says in Romans 1. And Romans 1 ends very heavy. And you have this group, the irreligious people, who um, clearly the wrath of God rests on. And so that's where we ended last week. And this week we're going to move into chapter 2, and the news doesn't get a whole lot better. But before we get there, I want to have Mark pray for us, and then we will we'll get into the text. Yeah, just the, the target of chapter 1 is the person outside of religion, and the target in chapter 2 is people inside the church, people inside religion who don't yet understand the gospel. So let's pray together. God, I just feel so incredibly weak right now. How do, how do we communicate what's in this text? Mm. If this text is true, I'm sure there are skeptics in the room but if this text in Romans 2 is true, then it means there are people in this room right now who think that they know Jesus and think that they have been rescued but are deceived. And this was me for 11 years of my life, so I am sympathetic with this person. But if it's true that there is religious lostness just like there's irreligious lostness, then no doubt in a room this big, there are a number of people. And I hope it is small. Who may be deceived about their standing before you. So Holy Spirit, I, I would ask you to do, like in the last service, after the service, a guy comes up to me weeping saying, I'm, I'm that guy. I pray right now that you would move Holy Spirit just like you did with some people last hour in this room and expose that. That you would draw us to the cross. That you would lead us to the gospel. That we'd be free of both religion and irreligion. That we would be free of our own unrighteousness and our own self-righteousness. And that we would flee to Jesus who alone is our righteousness and our salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul has just finished really blasting the irreligious. He says, listen, irreligious people violate their own conscience. They don't live up to their own standards. They know they do things that are wrong. They have a sense of right and wrong, and they violate it. Therefore, they are accountable to their creator. And if they do not repent and put their trust in Jesus, the wrath of God is coming. So it ends on that note. Then chapter 2, the religious people, listen to this, the religious people are hearing Paul, and Paul's really going hard after the, the irreligious people. They're going, you know, Sexual morality, parties, drunkenness, it's bad, it's bad. And all it's the bad. church folks shout, amen, Paul. All, all the church folks are like, Paul, you tell those people. You Go tell the heathen. Em. Tell those heathen what's right and what's wrong. So the religious people are starting to feel pretty smug, pretty self-righteous, pretty superior. They're like, yeah, you get them, Paul. You tell those people out there how bad they are. And then Paul knows. He's setting them up. He gets to the end of chapter 1, says the irreligious people are desperately in need of a Savior. And then he stops, and he turns to the religious hypocrite and says, you guys are in the exact same boat. Look at verse 1. He's been saying they all of chapter 1. They do this, they do that. And then look at verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. We are not known for that at all, are we as Christians? <laughs> you, yeah. For in <laughs> passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. He says, listen, religious people love to point the finger. 
Religious people like to go, they're the problem, that's what's wrong with the world, it's their fault, You're pointing at different political groups, different groups in our country saying they're the problem, they're what's wrong, and religious people have a very hard time seeing their own sin. They have a very hard time seeing their own junk, seeing that they are the problem, that they desperately need rescue, that they are desperately broken. In the Gospels, who gets the Gospel more, the prostitute or the Bible scholar? Prostitute. So the, the prostitutes who are broken, they know they're messed up. They know. There's no hiding that you're broken when you're in that lifestyle. They get that they're fractured, that they're splintered, that their life is a, is a wreck. And when Jesus shows up with grace, they get it immediately. Yeah. It's grace. It's salvation by grace, not by what I've done. And it's the, Jesus actually says, Matthew 21, verse 31, he says to the Bible scholars, the prostitutes and the tax collectors are going to enter heaven ahead of you. And you wonder why they killed him. Here's, uh, here's what's usually... <laughs> here's what's going on in chapter 2, and it goes on in the entire New Testament, really, with self-righteous religious people. They have several problems. Here are two of them. One is a, a deep misunderstanding of the nature of sin. A deep misunderstanding of the nature of sin and an intrinsic blindness to their own sinfulness. Here's what I mean by that. We, again, when you read one, it's easy to point outside of us. Paul and Jesus say that's not the problem. In fact, you remember Jesus said things like this. He would say, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. I say to you, if you've looked at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery. See what Jesus did there? Here's the law, and Jesus takes it up a notch. And he says, not, not only is the act of adultery sin, but you will be condemned to hell because of lust in your heart. Because lust is the seedbed where adultery takes place. And, and he went through all of these commands of the law. You've heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, you've already committed murder. And so, religious, self-righteous people have a misunderstanding of sin because they think that it's just the actions yeah. that condemn you. That's right. So, that there's an ignoring of the internal struggle. There's ignoring of sin within. And it's only dealing with actions outside. Well, think about this. If you worship what people think about you, if you worship reputation, that can motivate you to be a really good person. Yeah. So you, can, you don't, you don't want to lie because you might get caught and you might look really bad, so you actually tell the truth because you're worshiping what people think about you. Yeah. You might not go to the party because you're worshiping what people think about you. It is very easy to hide in the church. It, you understand, being inside a building like this right now is extremely dangerous. And I'm not trying to be funny. It is dangerous to be in this room right now because you might be tempted to think that because you came this morning, God favors you. Yeah. That because you're here and you didn't party all night and sleep in all morning, that you're better than that guy and that you're a little bit better off and God's more likely to bless you and give you what you want and be nice to you and treat you well. And that's a complete misunderstanding of the gospel. So I want to start with this point. With what, what is repentance? What does it mean to truly repent? Okay, I wrote this down because I didn't want to get it wrong. If you do not believe, and by when I say you, I don't mean your roommate. I don't mean your brother. I don't mean your parents. I mean you, okay? If you, if you do not believe personally that you deserve, that you deserve to go to hell, if you do not believe that you really deserve God's wrath, that you really deserve to be punished for your sins in hell, if you don't believe that, then you're not a Christian. That's Christianity 101. I am damned. Yeah. I'm lost. That's how you get in the door of Christianity is you go, I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. My heart is my greatest enemy. Not you, not someone else. Me. I'm enemy number one for me. I, if I go to hell, it will be because of my own sin, my own pride, my own self-righteousness, my own holier-than-thou behavior. And repentance is doing this. It's saying, God, I feel it. I know in my bones I'm the problem, and left to my own devices, I will perish just like an unbeliever in, outside of religion. I desperately need salvation, which is why, by the way, the Pharisees had a very hard time with Jesus, yeah. and the broken people didn't, yeah. because people who have their lives looking like they're together, it's much harder for them to see that they're in need of a Savior. 
Jesus gives us two categories. It's good to have categories so you can kind of see where you fit. Uh, in a story uh, all of us are familiar with. It's the story that we commonly call the prodigal son. If you, real quickly, if you know the story, there's a younger brother who comes to the dad and says, hey, dad, uh, I want my inheritance. It's basically the son saying, dad, I really wish you were dead so I could have your stuff. Here's what happens. The scandalous story is the dad, although probably insulted, grants the son's wish, gives him his inheritance. He runs off into foreign land and lives crazy. Uh, prostitutes, drunkenness. He just blows all the money dad gave him, all his inheritance, and he ends up in the worst possible place a young Jewish boy could end up, in a pigsty, eating the pig's slop. He comes to his self, it says, comes to his senses in the story Jesus tells us, repentance, comes to his senses and goes, you know what, it'd be better off to be a slave in my dad's house than to be where I am right now. So he takes off for home. The father, who's been obviously looking and waiting for him, sees far off the son making his way back, and the father runs to the son. He doesn't wait for the son to get cleaned up. He throws his arms around him, kisses him, takes his robe off, wraps it around him, kisses him, says, we're going to have a party. We're going to throw the biggest party, kill the fatted calf, sends the servants to the house to get everything ready, puts his ring on the son. He completely accepts the son back. And we usually stop the story there. There's another brother in the story. The older brother who's been home working hard the whole time. The younger, younger brother's been gone doing crazy stuff, and he's just angry. He comes back. He sees there's a party going on at Dad's house, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we would all feel that's a little weird. You're coming home to Dad, and you're like, why is there a subwoofer? Like, what's going on? So <laughs> they're partying, and so he's walking back. He calls a servant over. He goes, why is Dad throwing? Like, what, Dad's got a DJ? What's going on in the house? And this, the, servant goes, the servant goes, your brother came back, and your father has killed. And he's thinking, killed him? No. <laughs> Killed the fattened calf and thrown a party for him because he was dead, now he's alive, he was lost, and he's found. And the, it says the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So, in the story, the father represents God, and the father's party represents salvation, heaven, eternal life. Everybody with that? The father's God, the, the party is heaven. The wicked kid, the irreligious kid, the, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, that kid, the prostitute's yep. kid, he, he is rescued and saved. He's brought into the feast. The older brother who's the good church kid, never disobeyed his dad, never broke the rules, never broke the law, never went to jail, never got drunk, never slept around, he's kept himself pure, stands outside the house and is furious. The dad comes out, you remember him coming out to the younger brother, he also comes out to the older brother. And he says, son, son, please come in, your brother's back. And the son, the the son goes, look, very polite. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and you never gave me a young goat that I could party with my friends. I thought, a young goat? That's what he wants? So he says, he says listen, think about this. He is refusing, uh, honestly, think about this. He's refusing to go to heaven because he's been good. Yeah. He's saying, I'm not going in because of his pride in yeah. his moral achievements. He says, I'm better than those people. I'm not going in if it's these rules. I don't like grace. I like yeah. earning. I like effort. I like achievement. I like being better than these other people. That's how I view the world. So he stands outside insulting his father and says, I'm not going in because of my pride in my moral achievements. And he fails to understand the gospel. And Jesus is pleading at this moment with his critics and saying, I'm the father. I'm standing here talking to you and I'm pleading you come in let go of your self-righteousness abandon the, don't trust in the fact that you haven't had sex yet and you're not married yeah. do not trust in that to save you it will send you to hell if you trust in your good works they can't save you even good works bible reading and church attendance if you trust in them like the pharisees you will misunderstand the gospel the gospel is not religion <coughs> in that sense it is something else entirely and and so get the picture elder brother younger brother Romans chapter 1, younger brother. Yeah. Romans chapter 2, elder brother. Religious, rule-keeping, judging the younger brother. Both, Paul says, stand guilty before God. 
The, the younger brother, because his conscience knows. Remember last week we talked about that. Your conscience tells you there's a God and I'm disobeying him. My own personal story as a younger brother, I, I, I grew up, I didn't know anything about God, didn't care, um, introduced to alcohol at a young age, basically a functional alcoholic as a young teenager, went to college, it got worse. Uh, my, my gods were substances and relationships, and uh, I just didn't want anything to do with God. Uh, had a guy share the gospel with me in a really violent way. Um, he said to me, this is honestly how he said it. He said, you know John 3.16, right? And I said, yeah, everybody knows that. And he said, That's, that verse doesn't apply to you. <laughs> he said, John 3.36, that's your verse. John 3.36 says this, he who has the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son, the wrath of God remains on him. My friend said, that's where you're sitting right now. The wrath of God is on you. And unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will, you will die and you will go to hell. I was a college student and I thought that was the harshest thing anybody had ever said to me. But something in me knew he's right. And, and I remember uh, I had no desire to do anything religious. I hated the Bible. I didn't like Christians. I didn't want to be around anybody. I, I really didn't like anybody. And um, that's just the truth. I, just, I, had, I was full of self-hate, and I hated everybody. And uh, I remember sitting alone in the place where we lived and, and just breaking down and weeping and, and trying to cry out to God. I, I think, I, I, I don't even know, the whole prayer of prayer thing never worked for me because I, I didn't even know what I was saying. I was just weeping uh, and, and got up different. Because God had come, he had invaded my life, and he had come into my heart, and he had changed my motivations. And all of a sudden, I liked the Bible, which is weird for me. I couldn't read it, and I couldn't, I couldn't read it enough. And, I, and I, I, began to have, I began to develop a love for people. God's still working on that in me. Amen. Um, but I, but so, so God came to me, changed my heart as an elder as a younger brother. Um, and, and so if that's you in the room today, that God, God's, God's calling to you to run from that lifestyle. And when you hear Vic's story, I love hearing it. Every time I've heard it, his, his, once he really met Jesus, like for real, yeah. like a real encounter with the living Jesus, he changed. Did he become perfect? Can we all <laughs> no, say no together? No, no. no we don't but, need testimonies at this but, point. So although he did not achieve perfection, there was a change in direction, okay? This is really important. He did not reach perfection, but there was a tr dramatic change in the direction of his life. So if he said to you, I repented of my sins, I put my trust in Jesus, and then two weeks later he's back getting drunk every night and doing whatever he's doing, would you say his repentance was real? No. I hope so not. A, a change in behavior is the evidence that your repentance was yeah. real. And it has to be a lasting change because a change in nature is an abiding change. It's a lasting change. So look at verse 4. <clears throat> or do you presume on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That's the purpose. But, this is to the religious, because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So, so listen to what he's saying there. God, God gives us kindness. So if you're in the room today, and of course you're in the room today. I hate it when people say that, if you're in the room today. <laughs> Strike that from the record. If you're living a lifestyle that is just you're just running from God. And, and you, you know you've got this deep sin in your life or, or you're just really self-righteous and, and, and God hasn't, hasn't struck you dead. That's kindness. Do not mistake his kindness and his patience for license for you to sin. His kindness is space for you to repent. It's not a room for you to sin in. 
It's space for you to repent and to come to him and say, God, I need a savior. I need a savior. That's what God's kindness is there for. Um, so a, a sign that you haven't yet repented, let me get this quote up here. This is Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City who's really good. Here's a way to kind of test yourself and myself on this self-righteousness issue. Here's some signs that perhaps you're in the older brother category. Do you feel that you are a hopeless sinner whom God would have a perfect right to cast off this minute because of the state of your life and your heart? I mean, do you really believe that? Do you really feel I'm guilty? When you consider how those outside your church live, do you shake your head and judge them in your heart? Or do you think my heart is by nature just like theirs? It just shows itself differently in a religious context. Last one, have you accepted that your own values will condemn you and mm -hmm. that you will need to be given a right, you, you need to be given a right standing that you could never achieve for yourself? Here's the thing about us when we fall into the religion category. Here's what happens. When, when someone slanders me or lies about me, which has happened, and I find out about it, there is no mercy in my attitude. When the self-righteous side of me is taken over, it's just they deserve justice. They deserve punishment, just this anger toward them. But when I get caught slandering someone or gossiping, I go, well, it's complicated. There was reasons for why I said that. This is the way religion works. Religion is, I think religious people only have one finger, just pointing. Yeah. That's all they do. Yeah. And they're just, they're always out there, out there, out there. They're the problem. They wronged me. They lied about me. They did this. They did that. And there's never a pointing at your own heart. And so there's never this owning your own junk, your own guilt. And repent, repentance is realizing that you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. It's agreeing with God's assessment of us in Scripture. Yeah. It's owning our junk. It's finally stopping making excuses and rationalizing our behavior. It's when we finally stop making excuses for our gossip and our pride and our slander and our anger and our resentment and our grudges. Stop making excuses and own it. Say, I'm the biggest problem for me. And if I go to hell, it's going to be my fault, not somebody else. And we need to own our sin and bring it humbly before God, broken and shattered by his law. Which, by the way, what's the purpose of the law? What's the purpose of the gospel? The law is like a thermometer telling you that you're sick, but it can't heal you. If you try to find healing in the law, it won't work. You'll become a Pharisee. So the law is meant to show you you haven't measured up, you're not good enough, and the gospel is the medicine or the cure that saves you from your disease. If you switch the categories, you lose Christianity. Yeah. So the law is a good thing from God to show us that we have failed to measure his, up to his standard and we desperately need a Savior outside of ourselves. And, and before we go much further, I, I have to say this. Because if, you, if you're spending a lot of time in Romans 1 and Romans 2... This is what it sounds and feels like. You're saved by your works. Think about it. In, in chapter 1, all you've got are these behaviors, right? You have the sexual immorality. You have the disobedient to parents. Everyone, that's my favorite one as a parent, by the way. Um, you've got this whole list of behaviors. So it feels like, well, you've got to get the behavior right. And then he, then he gets into chapter 2, and some of the things he says in chapter 2 feels like you gotta, you got to do the right thing to get in. Six and seven. Six and seven in particular. Let me take you to a verse in chapter 3 to just ease your mind on that a little bit. All right, We'll, we'll get there next week, but I, but I want you to see it today because you need to see this. Verse 20 of chapter 3. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. Now, who gets justified by works of the law? No human being gets justified by works of the law since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Just like Mark said, the law is the thermometer. It shows you you're guilty. And so don't, please don't hear us today saying, you got to get cleaned up and get your act together and do a list of things to get in. So here's the danger. So look at verse 5 again of chapter 2. Because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath. And then verse 6, God will render to each one according to his works. This is where it gets confusing. To those who by patience in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Okay, pause. 
Paul is not teaching salvation by works here. Here's what Paul's saying. If you are an impenitent person, an unrepentant person, your lifestyle will show that you haven't repented. Like we yeah. talked about with Vic's conversion. If he stayed the same way yeah. he was, or you stay in the same level of self-righteousness you always had after you come to know Jesus, then it's evidence that you have not yet actually repented and trusted in Jesus. But if you truly repent, and there's real repentance and a real softening of your heart by the Holy Spirit, your lifestyle is going to change. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to change. And those are the, that's the evidence of whether or not you've truly repented or you, you have not yet repented. And there are examples of this all around us. Let me give you a real quick one. When I was a kid growing up, my, we had an apple tree in our yard. I, I put it in air quotes because my dad would say to my brother and I, this is an apple tree and it would bloom in the spring. It would look glorious. And there were, here was the problem. Never any apples on it. Never, not one apple in my whole life, one apple on the thing. So my brother and I, first of all, thought my dad was nuts. Dad, there are no apples, not an apple tree. In the woods close to where we lived, there was this wild tree that had, guess what, on it? Apples! So my brother and I, being the bright kids we were, were able to look at that and go, now that's an apple tree! Why? There's fruit the evidence that it was an apple tree or there were actual apples on it. So G Jesus, as you, uh, I know you probably all know this verse, but he, Jesus says in Matthew 12, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. The apples on the branches do not give life to the tree. Yeah. They prove that there's already life in the tree. Your good actions do not make you a Christian. They prove that you already are. Do you, you, you everyone following that? Because if you get that wrong, you misunderstand yeah. the whole oh. thing. If you so, get that long, wrong, that will crush you. Yes, because if you think of it as I've got to make myself a Christian by being good, you'll either try really hard and you'll sort of feel like you're achieving it and you're good and you'll become an, an arrogant jerk to everyone around you. You ever met that Christian? Amen. Those are my favorite people. Yeah. And on the other side, you've got people who will try to measure up, but they just can't have the willpower to feel like they're obeying the law, and they'll just feel like depressed failures. So morality on its own, d divorced from the gospel, produces arrogant jerks and depressed failures. Yeah. Right? But the gospel doesn't do that. The gospel gives hope, joy, and peace as it produces this fruit uh, in our lives. So when we're going to move down now into uh, verse 17, where he he starts to really turn the pressure up on religious people. In verse 17, he says, You call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. You know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. Now, I'm going to insert Christian for Jew here. So, you've got the Bible. You know it really good. you got all your doctrine figured out. And you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So he's saying to the Jews, this is, this is a great lawyer move by Paul here. You guys are, this is, this is what's good about you. You have all of these things. But look what he does in verse uh, 21. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourselves? When you preach, you get stealing. Do you not steal? You say uh, that one must not commit adultery. Do you not commit adultery? Now, the guess here is they may not be committing adultery. What Paul is doing is exactly what Jesus said. Yeah. You, you're committing adultery when you have lust in your heart. Don't, you can't see it because you're, you're so self-righteous. That you've got the law, you're just missing the gospel. Yes. Okay, so, so skip down to verse uh, 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. No, a Jew, okay, pause for a second. A Jew thought, because I am ethnically Jewish, I'm part of God's people. Okay? So he, he thought he was part of God's people just because of his ethnicity. So he says, a, a Jew is not merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision the covenant sign of the Jews, outward and physical only, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from man, but from God. So he says, real Christianity is not an external thing. 
It's not about just behavior and function externally. You right. can be the kind of person who can do that, but it's internal transformation and internal heart change. So I want, he told his story. I'm going to tell my story. He's the, the, the uh, prodigal, kind of like saying that, and I'm the older brother. So, so here we go. Let, let me explain my background. My dad's a pastor, been a pastor ever since I was pretty much born, still is a pastor. My mom grew up uh, as a missionary kid in Africa for the first 18 years of her life, so I've got all the church stuff going for me. The whole package. The whole thing. I grew up going to a Christian school from kindergarten through my senior year of high school. I went to Westminster Christian Academy. So I had Bible class every year my whole life. I was in uh, Wednesday night youth group. Uh, I was involved in all sorts of stuff. I became a member of our church. I was, I was baptized. I was all these different things. I, I, all that stuff. I professed faith in Christ. I had prayed the sinner's prayer. I, almost every morning it felt like I would pray the sinner's prayer every night, every time I got in the car, every time I got out of the car. Jesus, please come into my heart. I just prayed it like a ritual or something. And so I thought I was a Christian. Now, if you would have really pushed me, which I had one teacher actually ask me one time if I was really a Christian because there was some strange evidences that I might not be, I got really offended. And I said, listen, like, I may not have tremendous assurance that I'm a believer, but I knew, like, I never doubted deep down inside of me, I knew that if I died and I faced Jesus, we would work it out. I didn't know what that meant, but I just knew, like, I'm not going to actually go to hell. Like, I, did, I never was actually really afraid of that. I thought, I've prayed, I've been in church, I've asked him in my heart. When, when I actually meet him, he, he'll, he'll, we'll work something out. You had the sash, out. didn't you, with I all did the have the medals I did have on the it? sash with the, yeah. It was, all the Bible memory medals? I did, I had some of those. Um, it's true. So, so here, here's what happened. From age 5 to age 16, I thought I was a Christian, and I wasn't. Now, it says that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God at any, I think about this all the time. God at any moment between age 5 and 16 could have let me die in a car accident, could have let me die of a hundred different things, and this is what would have actually happened to me in 2002 if I would have died. I would have stood before God's throne, lightning and thunder, angels singing, the ground shaking, and I would have looked at him and said, hey, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm, I believed in you. I thought I did at least. Like, I, I've been in Christian school. Like, I've done all this stuff. I know verses. I've even tried to evangelize my lost friends. I, I cried at youth camp one time. Like, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And, and Jesus would look at me in that moment and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. And Jesus would have had me picked up and thrown into hell. I believe that. I absolutely believe that. And in, if that's true of me as one church kid, it was true of both of my brothers going through high school, there's no way that in a room this big, that's not a number of people's stories. And maybe you're not even aware of it. So you've got to do some examination here. If, if your heart is hard toward Jesus, it may not be hard toward church. You might like church. You might like youth group. You might like spiritual activities. You might like some sort of evangelism or, or even apologetics and debate. But do you love Jesus? Like, is there a real living relationship with Jesus? Is he real to you? Do you talk to him? Do you read about him? Do you worship Jesus? Is your life focused on him? Not perfectly. Of course not perfectly. But do you love him? Do you desire Jesus more than you desire all these other things deep down in your heart? Push comes to shove. Is that who you want to be with? Is that who you want to be around? Is that who you want to fellowship with and glorify and honor? Is he the person you want to get to know? If not, there needs to be some serious heart examination because... If parents will scare kids to death about texting and driving and the dangers there, how much more so about hell and the dangers there? If there is a real hell and there are people in this room right now who may be in danger this afternoon of going there, what else matters? Not the NFL. This matters, okay? You could die in a car wreck today. Your heart could stop beating right now. It's a muscle in your chest separating you from God right now. A beating muscle in your chest. If it stops right now, which it could, I know teenagers whose hearts have stopped. If it stopped right now, in 90 seconds, you're standing before the throne of God. And there's lightning. And if you do not know Jesus, if you have not closed with Christ and accepted him and repented and forsaken your unrighteousness and forsaken your self-righteousness as the grounds of your acceptance into heaven, Jesus will not smile if, if, if you have not done that. He will say, you'll say, I led Bible studies. I did many mighty works in your name. And he'll say, I never knew you depart from me. But here is the incredible news this morning. Mm. That wrath that you and I deserve, that absolute wrath of God coming against hypocrisy and evil and idolatry is sitting over some of our heads right now. And by the grace of God, if you trust Christ and repent in a real way right now, even today, 
If you do that today, the wrath of God will be lifted off of your shoulders. You can be free of an eternity of pain and enter into an eternity of everlasting joy right now for free. This thing doesn't cost you anything. It costs Jesus everything. On the cross, Jesus drank dry the cup of God's furious and righteous anger and wrath against your sin and mine. So that if we turn from our sin and self-righteousness and entrust ourselves to Jesus as our Savior, God, Lord, and King, we can be washed as pure as the snow. We can be cleansed and be white never more burdened by the guilt of our sin. This morning, that can be true of you. If it's never happened before, if you're an older brother, come to Jesus and be cleansed. If you're a younger brother, come to Jesus and be cleansed just as you are right now. And we're about to sing a song in just a minute. And in the song, it has this line. As, but as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state, and you led me to the cross. That can happen to you right now. God rescued me in 2003 and gave me a heart for him that I didn't have before that. And God can do that right now in your seat. And if you'd like someone to pray with, you can come up here and find somebody to pray with you as well this morning as we sing. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask the band to come. This is a moment. For you to examine yourself. We've said it multiple times this morning. This has nothing to do with your neighbor, your roommate, the person sitting next to you. This has everything to do with you and the living God. Please, please do some self-examination. Ask God to reveal through the Holy Spirit where you stand. You're in one of two categories, younger brother, elder brother. And, and we, Jesus is calling you to himself today. So as we stand to sing, I pray that you would do what God is commanding you to do today. If you need somebody to pray with you, grab somebody around you, come up. We'll have people up here that can pray with you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. I pray you would move among these people. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would grant repentance. You would grant faith that you would save today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.